We're turning to Luke chapter 23, please. We get to Luke chapter 23, we're at verse number 26. The Scripture says, And they led him away. They laid hold upon one Simon, a Cyrenian, coming out of the country. And on him they laid the cross, that he might bear it after Jesus. And there followed him a great company of people and of women, which also bewailed and lamented him. But Jesus, turning unto them, said, Daughters of Jerusalem, Weep not for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For behold, the days are coming in which they shall say, Blessed are the barren, and the wombs that never bear, and the paths that never give suck. Then shall they begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills cover us. For they do these things in a green tree. What shall be done in the dry? There were also two other malefactors led with them to be put to death. And when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, where they crucified him, and the malefactors, one on the right, the other on the left, then said, Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. The people stood beholding, and the rulers also with them derided him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself, if he be the Christ, the chosen of God. And the soldiers also mocking him, coming to him, offering him vinegar, and saying, If thou be the king of the Jews, save thyself. And a superscription also was written over him in letters of Greek, Latin, and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. And one of the malefactors which were hanged reeled on him, saying, If thou be the Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And he said unto him, verily, I say unto thee, today shalt thou be with me in paradise. And we'll finish there at verse number 43. Perhaps this morning, these are particular words that we all know very, very well. Great words that they are. We're focusing again here on the cross. But I want us to turn our thoughts and our attentions this morning just to a few thoughts, a few words that has been on my mind all week for this meeting. And then that hymn that we sang uh, just before it, and can it be summed everything up for me in my own mind, uh, that this was the message for this morning. It's a simple message. It's not a great intellectual message. I'm not coming here with man's wisdom. I'm coming here with a message just to focus our thoughts one more time, even before we turn to wait around the table again this morning. We have just finished a week of meetings in the church over there in Money Moor, based around Easter. Seven nights of nothing but preaching on the cross. The singers who came along They sang about the cross. The hymns that were chosen were all about the cross. The sermon titles and the preaching was all about the cross. Why was that? Because as the flyer for the invitation said, what's so important about Easter? And the answer is the cross. You see, if churches today preached the cross... And if pulpits today preached the cross, if our congregations today herald the power of the cross, and if all those sitting in churches today was to hear the message of the cross, what a difference our land would be today. I still thank God for the time that we had here in the lifeboat. We spent A good number of years here in the lifeboat, as Bertie said, in membership here. And we come, or we came from a church that preached the gospel here. And that's what I'm glad that we were able to bring our children up in as well. I remember preaching in a little mission hall one evening. It was many, many years ago, right at the very start of my Bible college training, I had prepared a gospel message for the mission hall. 
I made my way to a little tin mission hall right at the back end of a country lane and would travel the right wee distance to get there as well. And when I got there, there was a little prayer meeting was already starting. When it had finished, no one else had come along. Just the 15 to 20 Christian people who had sat in the prayer meeting just previous with me. I was a little bit worried. Mentioned it even before I had started. I said, I'm sorry. I've preached or I've prepared a gospel message for tonight. And I'm going to preach my gospel message that I had prepared. There's a man stopped me on the way out. And he said, you don't ever have to apologize for preaching the gospel because every one of us that is saved still loves to hear the gospel, still loves to hear about the cross, still loves to hear all about the blood. You know, that's something that stayed with me even till today. Maybe there's someone here this morning. Maybe you've been coming along to this church and maybe you're still outside the kingdom of God. Maybe you've heard the message of the gospel time and time again. Maybe you could preach the gospel back to me this morning. You know it that well. Maybe there's someone this morning and you've, you've come into the church service and maybe you're trying to hide yourself among the rest of the Christians. Maybe you're trying to fit in with the Christians that are all around. And if anybody looks at me, well, they'll not be able to single me out as I'm not saved. Listener, it's time to see what the cross means. It's time to understand what the cross means. A piece of advice I received many years ago was to get to the cross as quickly as you can and stay there for as long as you can. So let's look back at this message. Let's apply it to our hearts this morning. When the hymn writer says, Come with me, visit Calvary, where our Redeemer died. His blood, it fills the fountain. Tis full, tis deep, tis wide. To the uttermost he saves. Dare you now believe and his love receive. To the uttermost Jesus saves. Jesus saves to the uttermost. And Jesus still saves to the uttermost today. Unsaved soul this morning, it's time to realize that. Christian this morning, it's time to re-realize that. When did we stop singing that from our hearts? When did we stop really reliving what Christ did for us on Calvary? When did that stop being a song and an anthem for our souls, what Jesus did in our lives. Our thoughts for this morning have simply entitled them The Other Side of the Cross. You see, it's taken from a song that I was listening to through the week, which focused the mind that on everything that was going on around the cross and everything that was seen and even everything that was unseen around the cross on that day. You see, this wasn't just another everyday crucifixion that was being carried out. This wasn't just another everyday punishment and death that was carried out. This was all part of God's almighty plan to buy back your soul from sin. You think upon that at the end of this meeting. When you raise the bread to your lips, when you raise the cup to your lips, that this wasn't a normal crucifixion that day. This wasn't a normal death. This was the culmination of all the hatred. It was a culmination of all the venom. It was a culmination of all the evil that hell could muster up and fired against the man on the middle cross of Calvary. So what was happening on that great day? What was happening all around that hillside? What will we remember at the end of our meeting? Note with me firstly, we can say, number one, that tears were rolling. Tears were rolling. Focus our thoughts on Calvary, the place where Jesus bought your salvation, Christian. The place where Jesus went to that cross for you. This isn't just a story. This isn't just a piece of 
folklore history that has been handed down from generation to generation. This was God the Son. This was God incarnate coming down to this world for you and for me. And when we think of the cross, our minds focus upon the cruelty. It focuses upon everything physical that we see, the pain and the agony. But behind that scene and behind the man hanging upon the cross, picture the hurting. Picture the tears of those around as Jesus' mother stood and watched as the followers and the friends looked up at the cross as those whose lives had been changed by this man who walked the streets of Galilee as they now looked up at the cross there was tears there was tears look at verse number 28 it says but Jesus turning unto them said daughters of Jerusalem Weep not for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. Maybe someone this morning, maybe you're crying this morning. Maybe you're crying inwardly this morning. Maybe there's someone going through pain that's on the inside. Maybe it's pain on the inside, not this outward pain that we're reading around Calvary. Not from the ones gathered round the foot of the cross that looked up and the, and the tears started to roll, but maybe your tears are inward this morning. Maybe no one knows anything about the pain and the tears that you're going through today. Then note this, that despite everything that Jesus was going through, despite how much Jesus was dealing with, Jesus saw the pain and the tears of his children. That when Jesus looked down from the cross, he saw the tears in the eyes of his children. Christian, Jesus knows all about you. Jesus knows what you're going through. And like those all around the cross, he's speaking to you this morning. That he would look down from that cross and he would speak directly to those that were hurting. Tell me this, are you listening? Are you listening for his voice? You see, if we go on a little deeper, what a picture that little word paints for us. Because this was no ordinary cry. This was no ordinary cry that day. Instead, the word weep that you read there, it's the word to wail. It's the word to sob uncontrollably. Can you picture the noise around the hillside? Can you picture the noise all around of the almighty wail and the sob that was coming from those around the middle cross. Never lose that thought. Never lose the echo that came from around Calvary. The tears were flowing. Secondly, evil was cheering. Evil was cheering. As I, as I sat and I thought upon the cross that day, this day was like no other. As you already most likely know, it was no secret how much the Romans loved the process of crucifixion. They loved it as a death penalty. It was such an awful, shameful death. But this morning, if I can picture this wasn't, as I said, a normal day, if I can use that phrase, a normal day, it wouldn't have just been the same commotion around the hillside as this day brought forth. You see, the guilty parties would have been taken up into the hillside. They would have been crucified and they would have been left to die as a punishment for all to see. But you see, on this day, there was a celebration taking place. There was a celebration all around that hillside. Celebrations like none other. Evil was cheering. Luke chapter 23, verse number 20. Pilate therefore, willing uh, to release Jesus, spake again to them. But they cried. They cried. What does that mean? It means they cheered. It means they heralded. It means they rallied everybody else around to their cause. 
And this great cheer that went up around the hillside, what did it say? It said in verse 20, crucify him, crucify him. Evil and everything that stands against the words of Jesus flooded the streets of Jerusalem. Flooded the pathway as they made Jesus carry his cross towards the hillside. The cheers that flooded the population as they listened to Jesus going to that, that hillside. We see it today all around the streets of Northern Ireland. When groups disagree with a ruling that's biblically based, biblically sound, what happens? There's protests. There's celebrations takes place on the streets of our country. The streets are lined in protest with one aim, to try and reverse and to stop the words that Jesus spake. You see, Jesus' words strikes chords with those that stand against him. When you see any demonstration today across our land, they're standing against what God wants. When you see the people standing and cheering words of evil, they're standing against what God wants. And here on the streets of Jerusalem, unlike any other crucifixion, the death of the Savior was celebrated and evil was cheering. Matthew chapter 27 and verse number 29. Oh, they took it even further. It says they plaited the crown of thorns and they put it upon his head. And a reed in his right hand, and they bowed before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. You see, things like that didn't happen to an everyday criminal. We don't read about the two other malefactors lying beside him. We don't read about them receiving a special crown to be put upon their head. We don't read about them with a reed put in his hand. We don't read about any mockery coming in their direction. They were there to stand punishment for things that they had done. And they were left to die, so to speak, on their own. We don't read about any taunts coming their way. We don't read about the mockery coming in their direction. But that day, tears were flowing. Evil was cheering. Number three, we could say doubts were rising. Doubts were rising. I wonder how many doubts were rising at this stage throughout the hillside. Working men, working women, they'd left all that they had to follow Jesus. They took their stand in front of their families. They stood up and they said, this man, Jesus, this teacher, this healer that we've been listening to, I'm going to follow him. And they stood up and they left all that they had and they followed this man, Jesus, who moved from town to town. They announced him as their friend and as their guide. But what now? Where was he? He was nailed to a cross. He was nailed to a cross. Oh, they were with him right up until the Garden of Gethsemane. They were there right until the swords and the spears came out. They were there waiting for Jesus to call down the angels into response. As they took him out of, the, out of the garden, they were there waiting for Jesus to give the command. And the angels would have come down and, and stopped the arrest. But Jesus just walked away with them. Jesus just calmly walked away. What's going on? I'm sure they cried out. What's heaven going to do? How's heaven going to stop this? And surely as the tears flowed, evil was cheering. Surely the doubts were rising. Surely the doubts were rising. Mark 14 and verse 50, it says, and they all forsook him and fled. Listen to this morning. Have you ever let doubts cloud your mind? Have you ever let the hard times cloud your mind? The things that you go through and they're difficult. Have you ever allowed the doubting little words of the enemy creep into your ears uninvited? When things aren't going the way you thought they would go. When everything's going wrong. When you seem to be in the valley much more than you are on the hilltop. 
When things are so difficult and one thing leads to another thing which leads to another thing. And before you know it, everything's starting to crumble all around about you. And down in the valley you go once again. And the old enemy comes into the ear and what does he say? The same thing he said in the Garden of Gethsemane. They said, Jesus is gone. Jesus is gone. Jesus can't help you now. Tell me this, have you ever listened? Have you ever listened to him? Have you ever believed in the words of the enemy? Great to hear of a week of prayer just last week. What a great way to stifle the words of the enemy. A great word, a great way to stop those little messages penetrating into the brain. We're working through at the minute <clears throat> over in Money More the armor of God. Another God-given giving armor for us, a protection for us. Christian, keep those eyes on the Savior. Keep them on God this morning. How many doubts were rising right the way there from Gethsemane when the poor old disciples in their own strength looked up when they saw the crowd coming and they saw the spears. And they saw the swords. But no doubt they sat back and said, don't worry. Jesus has this under control. Jesus is going to step in any minute now. Any minute Jesus is going to step in. And any minute Jesus is going to put these enemies away. Before too long, his arms behind his back, Jesus walks off calmly with them. Listen, don't fall victim to the evil ploy of the enemy. It's always darkest before the dawn. It's always darkest before the dawn. Don't allow the victory to slip of what God can do and what God has done in your life. Don't allow a moment of doubt to destroy that. You're on the victory side this morning. Keep trusting Jesus. Those storms are sealed. You have his promise. He will not fail. And even though the doubts were rising from his disciples, and even though the doubts were rising from those who stood looking up at the Messiah and what was happening, the final breaths was leaving his body. The final breaths were leaving the, the body of the Messiah. And they said, surely any time now, surely any time heaven is going to answer, and surely any time now, the angels are going to take every one of those nails out of his body. And the last breaths continued to leave. Christian, we're in the last days. Keep those doubts and those worries at bay. The Savior's coming soon. Tears were flowing. Evil was cheering. Doubts were rising. Number four, blood was flowing. Praise God, this wasn't the end because the blood was flowing. Why was the blood flowing? Because the blood was required. The blood was required. We needed the blood, and so the blood was flowing. Right back from Old Testament times, the blood was a sign of forgiveness. Exodus chapter 12 and verse 13 says, And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. As the blood flowed on Calvary, salvation for sin was on offer. What does it say in verse number 23? It says the blood was flowing down the cross. Verse, 30, verse 23 says, Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them. You see, when the blood started to flow, forgiveness was on offer. Listener this morning, do you know that salvation? Do you know that salvation yourself? Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Do you know this morning that forgiveness of sin is available? It's not from a church and it's not from a preacher, but it's for the one who died on the middle cross of Calvary for you. That as the blood flowed down, forgiveness of sin was made. And Jesus himself said, Father, forgive them. Forgive them. Hebrews 9, 9 and verse 22 says that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. No remission for sin. 
the blood of the cross that day, 1 John 1 and verse 7. The blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Every single sin. Every single sin. Even around the hillside that day. That's the bit our mind doesn't allow us to think about sometimes. That's the part that our brain, our brain, because of our humanness, doesn't even allow us to even think upon that the very men who hammered the nails into the hands of the Savior, the blood covered them too. That the ones who platted the thorns and put them upon his head, the blood covered them as well. But they didn't cry out. But they didn't call out. You see, if they had have called out the way the old thief on the cross called out, the blood would have covered them as well. Praise God this morning. And for you, listener, whether you're in this building or whether you're, you're watching elsewhere, listen again. As the blood <clears throat> flowed down the cross that day, the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Tears were flowing. Evil was cheering. Doubts were rising. Blood were flowing. Souls were rejoicing. Souls were rejoicing. You see, that old thief on the cross, what an important look at that very last moment. Living below in this old sinful world, where could I go but to the Lord? And there as he hung as a punishment for his crimes on this earth, it was there that he came face to face with the one who loved him and with the one who gave himself for him. What a thought. <clears throat> to think that his final act on this earth was simply to look into the face of the one in complete faith, to look into the eyes of Jesus. Oh, he might have done some awful things in this world. He might have done enough things to put him on that cross beside the Savior. But the very final act that he ever did on this earth was to turn his head and to look into the eyes of the Savior. Verse number 42. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. What a reply. Jesus said unto him, verse 43, Verily I say unto you, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. No ifs, no buts, no maybes. The moment the old thief turned in faith, the moment the old thief cried out in expectancy of salvation, heaven heard. Heaven heard. His final act was a simple look in faith. And Jesus heard. Friends, this morning, if you're here and you're unsaved this morning, one look to Jesus. One cry out to Jesus. And Jesus will hear. Maybe you've been attending this church for a long time. Maybe you haven't just taken that step of faith as yet. The thief could do nothing for himself. There was no way he was coming down. There was no way he was going to change his life on his own. He could only trust the Savior. And that day, even though his body was in agony as well, his soul rejoiced all the way into the splendors of heaven because he turned in faith. Listener, could you say the same? Maybe you've tried living your best, but it's not enough. Maybe you've tried all the church activities. Maybe you've thrown yourself into everything that the lifeboat can offer, and you've tried to make a difference yourself, but it wasn't enough. Maybe you've tried religion, and religion wasn't enough. Listen, who knows what that old thief on the cross tried throughout his life? The reality was, this man wasn't always a thief. He wasn't born a thief. He was born as a child. He grew up as a young person. But he was never born a thief. At some point, 
this young man took a wrong turn. And somewhere in his life, he resorted to crime, and that decision put him on a cross, a Roman tree, beside the Savior. But for every Christian parent listening, one day, in faith, he turned his eyes to the Savior. To every Christian parent today, praying for that son, praying for that daughter, for every soul today, praying for that family member. And at every turn, they seem to have taken the wrong way. One day, this old thief turned his eyes to the way, the truth, and the life. And the way, the truth, and the life hurt him. And the way, the truth, and the life saved him. Tears were rolling. Evil cheering, doubts were rising, blood was flowing, souls were rejoicing very quickly. Chains were breaking. Chains were breaking. Salvation was on display that day. No longer would sin's forgiveness be for one earthly man to atone for. Salvation was on offer. Verse 45. Verse 45, read it with me. It says, The sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was rent in the midst. We've heard this week much already on the news screens how people flocked to watch the sun go dark with an eclipse. But you see, on that particular day, Calvary was special. The sun went dark for a great reason that day. Because as the sun went dark and the temple veil ripped in two, salvation Forgiveness of sins, atonement for sins was open to each and every person who called you and me alike. You see, every one of us is in the same boat. We're all sinners. Sinners needing a Savior. The Scripture says we can be sinners saved by grace this very morning. Chains were breaking. Sin was defeated. Christian, we're going to heaven soon because of it. The hymn writer says, Thou hast snapped my fetters. Thou hast made me free. Liberty and gladness I have found in thee. We sing those words of victory. Oh, praise the Lord. My shackles are gone. My spirit is free. Chains were breaking. Why? Because that day on Calvary, a day like no other, a crucifixion like no other, Jesus took the debt of sin upon himself. And there he went to battle for my soul and for your soul. Listen to these words as we draw to a close. And think upon them as we meet around this table in a few moments' time. What if those words weren't true? What if they weren't true? What if Calvary didn't happen? What if Jesus had a fought back in the Garden of Gethsemane? What if he didn't go to that middle cross? What if he simply walked away from this hateful world and walked away from all the people that was fueled by sin had it not been for a hill called Mount Calvary, had it not been for the old rugged cross, had it not been for a man called Jesus, then forever my soul would have been lost. Lost. The word was lost. Not the word unhappy, not the word sad, but the word said lost. Jesus said lost. The scriptures says lost. As awful as Calvary was, Jesus took my sins and your sins upon himself, and he took them to the cross for me and for you. What a turnaround for all those who orchestrated the whole event. What a slap in the face it must have been for those who paraded Jesus through the streets as some sort of carnival as they tried new and better ways to humiliate the Savior. And as Jesus was lifted high upon that hillside there at Calvary, he says, there, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. You see, crucifixion, 
was reserved for the worst of the worst. The Roman government loved it to make examples out of the worst of the worst. But that day, the best of the best hung there for me and hung there for you. As we lift the bread to our lips, as we lift the cup to our lips, don't just do it out of mere tradition. Think upon every part of that hillside. What an example he left. Lamb of God, slain for us. What a love. What a cost. We stand forgiven at the cross. Let's stand and we'll sing that lovely verse as we close. 166 in our hymn books. 166. Give me a sight, O Savior, of thy wondrous love to me, of the love that brought thee down to earth to die on Calvary. Oh, make me understand it. Help me to take it in. What it meant to thee, the Holy One, to bear away my sin. 166. And we'll sing the first two verses as we close, please. Father, we do thank you this morning in the words of the hymn writer. Oh, make me understand it. Help me to take it in what it meant to thee, the Holy One, to bear away my sin. Lord, we're grateful this morning for every part of what Calvary meant. Lord, but help us to keep it in our minds. Help us to understand what it truly meant, not just, uh, not just to the world, but what it means to to each of us individually, to buy that salvation for us. Lord, we pray that you'll part us with your blessing for those that will leave. Lord, as we gather around this table today, may we take of the bread and may we take of the cup in complete remembrance, this do in remembrance of me, until the day that we see the face of the Savior. For we ask it in your name. Amen.